Hello everyone, welcome to this uh, newest video in our model selection series. And this is going to be about the heart of the series, if you wish. Um, it's about the lasso algorithm and we're going to need everything that we have seen until now. Okay, so what does lasso stand for? It stands for least absolute shrinkage and selection operator. And essentially, it means to minimize this problem, right? We have seen this a couple of times. So this is our regression problem. So fitting a linear model, potentially, you know, we raise the input in dimension using a feature map, but still it's a linear mapping of, of some input features to the output. So we minimize this one plus the L1 norm as a penalty term. So in short, this L lambda is really parameterized by the lambda and this, this sparsity enforcing loss function. And so Lasso is all about finding an optimum to the solution and Lasso does, does not necessarily mean a very specific algorithm, but it's sort of this problem formulation that we want to find. And as we have seen before, this one norm will help us to enforce sparsity in the weight vector. So hopefully we will have a small number of non-zero weights. And so our task is now to solve this problem. And we have seen before, because the one norm is not differentiable, wherever at least one weight is zero, we have this problem that the sub-differential truly is a set, okay? So we have a convex set between minus one and plus one in the coordinate where the, the w is zero, right? So everywhere outside the zero, this is still a differentiable function, but we have these non-differentiable points. And since we want to find sparse solutions, these points are actually part of our optimal solution. So it's not simple enough to just ignore this. We need to account for this in a way. And so there are a bunch of algorithms out there, and one that I'm going to present is not the fastest anymore, right? So there are techniques that are more complicated and involve um, proximal gradient methods with momentum, so you can ensure that you have very efficient solution algorithms, but what I'm going to present is something that will lead us to the solution in the same way. And um, it can actually be derived in closed form, so it has very nice properties, it does work, even though nowadays some algorithms where you need more specialties uh, from the optimization area um, may be faster. Still, I guess that this will give us a very good idea how to solve the lasso problem and we learn something about uh, non-smooth optimization along the way. So what is the idea? The idea is actually of solving this problem coordinate by coordinate. Because if we do this, then for a single weight, this can be solved in closed form. For multiple weights, it cannot. For a single weight, it can. And so the algorithm that we're going to use is coordinate descent. And the idea is actually quite straightforward. What we do is we fix the weight vector, but not entirely, except the jth entry. Okay, so this makes it a scalar optimization problem in terms of the number of trainable parameters or parameters we need to optimize for. And then we optimize for wj. This will give us an optimal solution and it will have the benefit that this can be found in closed form. But of course we cannot do this a single time we need to sweep through the WJs. And as if this is not enough, we cannot do it once, we need to do it cyclically multiple times, okay? Because once you have optimized for one weight and you optimize for the next, maybe the solution you have found previously is not optimal any longer for the previous weight because they're all connected. But still, this will converge. And then in the end, you have a very neat algorithm to solve this problem in a sequence of closed form optimization problems, okay? So how do we do this? Um, first of all, we need to look at this loss function and we're going to do this in its scalar formulation, so for each individual weight, which is why I need to resolve this in terms of the individual weights, right? So let's start with this. The L lambda W can be rewritten 
as the sum over all the samples, right, this is what the Frobenius norm means, the i goes from 1 to capital N, and then we have the yi minus, so what I'm assuming now is a scalar output, right, so this big y is just a, a vector for the individual samples, but it's not a matrix, so it's a, um, a scalar output, so not a, not a multivariate problem, um, and what I need to subtract is the model. And what the model really is, is a weighted sum of the inputs, so it's j equal to 1 until the degrees of freedom q, and then the entry in my regressor matrix from the ith sample and the qth entry times the qth weight. Okay, this one is what I subtract. So this is really w times z. Okay, so you have y i minus uh, minus uh, z i times w in, in vectorial form, but now I have resolved the vector, and so we take the square. This is basically this one written as a sum over all the samples plus lambda times the one norm. Uh, sorry, here it is. Okay, and so what we're going to need now is two terms. This is our regularization term, and this is, excuse me, this is our main loss, this is our regularization term. And so what we need to do is we need to calculate the derivative of this one first, and then of this one second, and the sum of the two derivatives has to be zero, or this, if it's a sub-differential, the zero has to be contained in the convex hull. So now let's consider the sub-differential of the first expression, which actually is a gradient because this is differentiable. So what I can do is, if I take the derivative of a lambda with respect to the jth entry now only, which means, right, I'm considering this component-wise. This is what I want to do in my coordinate descent algorithm. Then what I get is I get two times this bracket times the, the inner derivative, which is the derivative of this one with respect to the j's value, which will give me minus and the z i j. Okay, so what I get is minus two times the sum and now the inner derivative z i j times the bracket itself, right? So it's y i minus once more the sum j equal to 1 q z i j w j. Okay. So you see clearly this is the derivative, right? It's 2 times the bracket, so 2 times the bracket, times the inner derivative with respect to wj, which is minus zij. So this is my derivative, and this is what you see where the coupling becomes uh, comes into play, right? So even though this j, or excuse me, maybe I should be using another counter here, because the j is fixed now, right? So this is the, the j's derivative, so let's use the k here. So you still need to sum over all the weights, even though you're only calculating the derivative with respect to the j's weight, okay? So this is what we have, and now we can try to rephrase this in separating what depends actually on the wj and what does not depend on the wj, okay? So this sum has to be separated into all the indices except j and the index with j. And this is going to help us because in the end we can then, you know, derive two terms, one which depends on the jth entry and one which is a constant, okay? So let's do it. And so this is just rewriting, if you wish, so minus two times the sum, i equal one till n, and now you have z i j, times um, this expression, which is y i, minus, and now we have to separate this sum, right? So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to sum over all the k's that are not j, z i k w k, okay, so this sum goes from 1 to q, but does not consider the j. So what I need to do is, I need to subtract the j separately. 
Okay, so you see, this looks a bit nasty, but actually it's not so hard. So what we have done is we've taken the derivative, and now we have split the sum into all indices except j and the index with j. Okay. And so what this does for us is we can separate everything where the wj plays a role into everything where the wj does not play a role. Okay. So here, everything here is where wj does not feature, and here is where the wj does feature. Okay. And so we're going to rearrange the coefficients a little bit. What we see is that if we had minus two times the sum i from one till n, um, zij and then yi minus the sum of all k and without j zik times wk so all i've done is you know just written the first part and i have minus minus so plus two times and now I'm rearranging things, wj, and now I'm taking the sum again, i equal 1 to n, and now this is zij squared. Okay, so what we have done is we have rewritten things and we can give things names now. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to call this coefficient um, rho j, and I'm going to call this coefficient here, phi j. Okay. And so this looks very, very technical, but in the end what we see is the derivative of the loss function with respect to wj is a constant factor if we fix all the other weights, plus a linear factor with respect to wj. And so this is really helpful because we can now try to use this to find points uh, that are optimal. Okay. So what is left is the second part, the derivative with respect to the one norm. And so this one is actually quite simple. So the derivative of, um, oh, excuse me, I've made a mistake here because this is not the entire thing. This is just the first part, which I'm going to call L here. And I'm going to call this L sparsity, right? So this is only the derivative with respect to the first part. What we need is the subdifferential of the sparsity term. Right. And there we see now that we have a case distinction. Okay. What we get is this is minus lambda for wj being negative. We get the interval minus lambda to lambda for wj being zero, and we get plus lambda for wj being positive. Right? So this is exactly the definition of a subdifferential. So it's the convex hull of the left and right side gradients, which is uniquely defined in the differentiable regions and which gives us this set at points where we are not differentiable. And so we can set these two things together to get a subdifferential for the L lambda. This is what I falsely wrote here right away. So in combination, what we get is our complete loss function is again a case distinction that we need to consider for these three cases. Um, for negative j, we will get um, that this is two, minus two times rho j plus two times wj phi j, right? So I can simply copy this, so minus two times rho j plus two times wj times phi j. And so not to make confusion, this is just, I'm giving it a new name, right? Um, minus the lambda for negative wj. And then if wj is zero, we basically get the same expression, but if wj is zero, the second term vanishes. So we have minus two uh, rho j minus lambda to minus two rho j plus lambda. So we again get this interval, minus two rho j. This is what stays of the first one if w is zero. 
minus lambda, so the left hand side, until minus 2 rho j plus lambda for wj being 0, right? Again, recall this second term vanishes. And then if we do this, the third thing again, we have just, again, this expression exactly, but not minus lambda, uh, but plus lambda. So if minus 2 rho j plus 2 omega j phi j plus lambda, in the case wj is positive. Okay, so this looks like a nightmare, but what this really leads uh, us is a case distinction. We can now solve this one by setting it to zero, right? So this one has to be zero, or this one has to be zero, or this one has to be zero, right? Depending on the case. And so because we're solving for w and we are not solving for the rho j or the phi j, we need to study these instead. Okay, so what you will see, the phi j is the sum of the zij squared. So this is always going to be positive, okay? So all we need to take care about is the rho j. So if this were this phi j is positive, you have the case distinction in terms of the rho j to see whether this, if we set this equation to zero, leads to a negative wj or whether it leads to a positive wj. And so what we get is three cases. Okay, so let me first write it and then I, we, we can discuss this once more. Okay, so this tells me rho j is smaller than minus lambda over 2. So what we do is we set this one to 0, right? So we have this one is 0 or this one is 0 or this one is 0. Or the 0 is contained. Let's make it clearer. The zero is an element of this one. And so if rho j is less than minus lambda over two, so what you need to do is you need to solve this equation for the w. So what you do is you do the minus two rho j onto the other side of the equal sign, you do the lambda on the other side of the equal sign, and then you divide by two times phi j. So what you get is the wj is equal to rho j plus lambda over 2 phi j. Okay? And now you see why this condition is important. If the rho j is less than lambda over 2, you get a smaller quantity at lambda over 2, this is still negative. And you divide by a positive quantity, so this is a negative value, so this means it's consistent with the condition. So for rho j less than lambda over 2, this will lead to a, a negative wj. So it's consistent with this one. Um, and so what you get is this condition actually is consistent with this one. Right? And then we have the second case where we can just say the, the wj is zero, this is defined. What we need to ensure is that actually this interval contains zero, which means the rho j has to be in between minus lambda over two, which would mean that if it's smaller then this one is still positive, and it has to, uh, sorry, because of the minus sign, this is still negative, and between plus lambda over 2, right? So what you get is as the second case, if minus lambda over 2 is less than or equal to rho j, which is again less than or equal to plus lambda over 2, you get the answer we already know, wj is 0. Okay, so why is this the case? If you ensure this then you can make sure that the zero is contained in this interval. So you have a negative number here, you have a positive number here. For other um, rho j's, both will be positive or both will be negative, so this one is violated. And then you are in one of the other cases. And so what's left is naturally the third one, which is rho j greater than zero, uh, sorry, minus lambda over two, which will simply give you the expression like this, but solved for wj now. So wj will be rho j, you put this to the other side, minus lambda over 2, divided by phi j. Okay, so this was a lengthy derivation, but what you see now is this is really consistent. If the rho j is greater than minus lambda over 2, and then you subtract 
lambda over 2, this will give you a positive value. Okay? And so what we have is that this condition is consistent with the wj being positive. And so what we can find, in fact, is that um, the procedure in our optimization problem is simply you fix the wj, you calculate rho j and phi j, which are constant given that we fix all weights except for the j one, so this is just data. This is data, input data, output data, and the other weights. So you have these two, and then you make the case distinction for the rho, which is smaller than lambda 2 in between or greater than lambda 2, and then you set the weight to 0 or this value or this value. And so what you will get is for standard regression, you would get something like this. And for our case, what you now get is lambda over 2, sorry, plus lambda over 2, and here you have minus lambda over 2. You actually get that in between this interval, you have zero weights. And then this is how your regression curve will look. And so you see, we have seen this pictorially, but now you also see this uh, from a mathematical derivation, actually the lambda enforces sparsity because the larger we make lambda, the more likely it is that the rho j will be in this interval. And we have a lot of zero weights. Okay, so this was a rather technical derivation, but we can use this now in the next video to actually implement the lasso and study all these things we have learned for now. So regularization and cross-validation and how to select the best lambda to make sure that we have a good sparsity, but still a small loss function value. So thanks a lot and see you in the next video.